Uh, I would like to thank the organizers for inviting me to give these lectures. Um, I will be talking about uh, uh, black holes and quantum information. And my talk uh, will be centered around uh, the black hole information paradox. So I will review the paradox and uh, I will explain uh, that it is a fundamental conflict between general relativity and quantum mechanics. And I will also emphasize uh, why this paradox is closely related to a somewhat different question, uh, which is uh, what happens to an observer crossing the horizon of a black hole. So at first sight, these seem to be two different questions, but they're, oops, they're actually uh, closely related. And this, I hope this will become clear uh, during my lectures. And uh, a point I want to emphasize already now is that uh, this is a paradox. Uh, it is an IR paradox. So it is a paradox that we can phrase within effect field theory. And in particular, uh, while we expect that uh, our understanding of space-time may be modified by quantum gravity at very small scales, this paradox suggests that uh, there may be modifications of space-time even at macroscopic scales at the quantum level. Uh, in particular, as we'll discuss, it may have implication about uh, notions such as locality over uh, macroscopic scales. And uh, by thinking about this paradox, we may be uh, led uh, towards uh, identifying the fundamental principles of, of, of quantum gravity. Now, apart from these general comments, uh, uh, there is also a concrete technical question that uh, I will try to address in my lectures, which is related to, uh, to these questions. And uh, this is uh, uh, the question of how do we describe uh, the interior of a black hole in the context of the ADCFT correspondence. So as you probably know, ADCFT has been uh, very successful uh, in uh, explaining certain quantum aspects of black holes, for example, black hole entropy. Uh, however, uh, this question of what happens behind the horizon of a black hole remains uh, mysterious even today. And in particular, um, even if we've had the complete solution of the quantum field theory in ADCFT, so for example, if somebody gave you the exact correlators of the n equals 4 at strong coupling, uh, at the moment we don't even know uh, how to get that information and extract from it uh, the, the question of what is the space time behind the horizon. So there's an important conceptual problem here which is, uh, which is open and it's very interesting. So, um, and in particular, uh, if we want to understand, for instance, what happens at the black hole singularity by using the ADCFT correspondence, we have to understand how to describe the black hole interior from the CFT. So it is an important question. Now, uh, in my lectures, I will start by a review of uh, uh, the information paradox. Then uh, I will explain how it is connected to the smoothness of the horizon. Uh, in my third lecture, I will uh, try to formulate this, these problems in ADCFT. And uh, finally, I will discuss some uh, proposals for uh, resolutions and some other recent developments. In particular, I will um, talk about uh, something called the mirror operators, uh, the ERAPR proposal, and some uh, recent results uh, related to traversable wormholes, which can be used to address some of these questions. So um, my first two lectures will be a little bit uh, more pedagogical and, uh, and slow, and uh, my uh, last two lectures will be more technical. And I, I have decided to use a combination of, of slides and Blackboard, uh, but uh, you can give me feedback. If you prefer that I switch off the slides and I just do Blackboard, we, we can do that. Just let me know after the first lecture. And um, uh, also, I would like to encourage you to ask questions during, during, during my lectures. All right, so let's start. So I will start by reviewing very quickly some basic uh, uh, classical aspects of black holes. So we will be mostly thinking about uh, the source of black hole, so uh, a, a spherically symmetric uncharged black hole. But most of the uh, results that I will be talking about can also be translated to black holes which include uh, charge or rotation, as long as we are away from extremality. So uh, for extremal or supersymmetric black holes, uh, most of the statements I'm going to make have to be uh, modified. And uh, as you know, this uh, solution has two special features, the, the singularity at r equals 0 and the horizon at r is equal to 2gm, where uh, uh, we know that uh, uh, the, the horizon is a coordinate singularity. So in particular, if you calculate the curvature of space-time as a function of the radius r, you find uh, this, uh, this, this result. And if you uh, evaluate the curvature of the space-time at the horizon by taking small r equal to 2gm, you find that the curvature of the horizon is uh, inversely proportional to the power of the mass. So for a very large black hole, the curvature of the horizon is, is very small. And uh, thus we expect that uh, an infalling observer would not experience anything dramatic when crossing the horizon of a big black hole. 
Now, uh, to make this more precise, we can uh, consider a, a change of coordinates. Uh, for example, we can uh, introduce crucial coordinates, uh, which allow us to extend the space-time beyond the, uh, the original uh, coordinate range that we started with. And we get this diagram where uh, we have uh, the, the black hole interior represented by this part of the space-time. And as you know, we have the white hole region and a second asymptotic uh, space-time. Now, when we first learn about this diagram in general relativity, uh, usually we say that uh, the left region is uh, some sort of mathematical idealization, and um, the physical meaning of this region is not very clear. Uh, but uh, nowadays, there is a, a, a better understanding which I will try to address uh, in, my, in my later lectures. Now, if we have a black hole, which is formed by... So this, this is the, the diagram which is relevant for what is called an eternal black hole. So this is a black hole whose exterior is described by the Schwarzschild metric for all times. But if you have a black hole formed by gravitational collapse, uh, at early times, the metric is going to be different. And in particular, you have to take into account uh, of the geometry in the interior of the star which formed the black hole. So instead of working with this diagram, uh, if we have a black hole formed by collapse, we will, uh, the, the diagram is truncated at some point. Uh, this gray region represents the interior of the star. So the metric inside the star is not the Schwarzschild metric. It, it, it depends on the details of the star, but the exterior is uh, Schwarzschild. And in particular, if you want to ask questions about the late time, uh, uh, late time questions, for example, what happens to an observer falling into the black hole at late times, uh, you can see that we can approximate those questions by doing a calculation in the, in the eternal black hole uh, rather than the one uh, which is formed by collapse. So I will also be uh, using uh, Penrose diagrams uh, quite a lot. So just to remind you very briefly, uh, these diagrams uh, are a way of depicting the space-time, uh, of, of mapping the, the infinity of space into a finite region on the blackboard. So we consider a, a conformal a, a rescaling of the metric. You take the metric and you multiply it by an overall uh, scalar factor, which depends on the coordinates. And in this way, uh, you do not modify the causal relationship between events. Uh, so two events which are time-like in the original metric are going to be time-like in the new metric, the rescaled metric. Those which were null will re remain null, and so on and so forth. So the causal structure of space-time can be read off from this diagram. But at the same time, we're able to map the, the infinite region of uh, flat space, the asymptotic region of flat space, into a finite region. So these diagrams are very useful for um, understanding the causal relationship between events, but they, can be, they do not have the information of the physical distance between points. So in particular, physical distances can be misleading when you look at the Penrose di diagram. Uh, for example, if you look at this uh, little corner here, it, it seems to be a finite region on the Penrose diagram, but it actually represents an infinite region of uh, flat space. Uh, so uh, in these diagrams, we have uh, a, 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 we, this is a two-dimensional diagram for a four-dimensional metric. So every point on this diagram, uh, you should think of uh, a two-dimensional sphere living uh, over every point, and the size of the sphere will depend on where you are on the diagram. Uh, in particular, uh, as you move towards the bifurcation point, uh, the sphere uh, gets smaller and reaches the minimum size exactly the bifurcation point, equal to where the radius becomes equal to 2 gm and then it starts growing again as you move towards the left. And this uh, sphere uh, also, as you can see from the metric, shrinks to zero on the singularity where the space-time uh, well, becomes singular. In the case of a collapsing black hole, uh, the Penrose diagram has this form. So here we see the star which collapses and forms a black hole. And uh, this vertical line represents uh, the, the origin of spherical coordinates. Uh, so the sphere shrinks to zero size, but in a smooth way. So this is a smooth region of space-time. And in particular, light rays, which move at 45 degrees on this diagram, when they hit their line R equals zero, they get reflected uh, in, in a smooth way. All right, so this is the classical story. And uh, of course, things become interesting when we consider quantum mechanics. So I will start by uh, reviewing for you uh, the calculation of Hawking, um, which will be the, uh, the starting point for us. So what Hawking considered is uh, the classical geometry of a collapsing star, which a star collapsing into a black hole, and he uh, considered the quantization of the scalar field uh, on the background, on this classical background. And uh, what he found was that even if you uh, start with a state with no particles for this field uh, in the far past, 
you get a thermal flux of particles uh, in the far future. And in, in particular, he found that this uh, flux, the, 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 the radiation that you get, depends only on the mass of the black hole and not on the details of the star which formed the black hole. So the way this calculation is done is by working in a particular approximation of quantum field theory in curved space-time. Which means that, we, uh, of course, we cannot do a calculation in full quantum gravity. We don't know the full theory of quantum gravity, so we want to work in an approximation. And that approximation is the one where we take uh, the classical metric to be, uh, cla the background metric to be classical and given, and then we take a, a quantum field on top of that metric and we try to quantize it. Now, the reason that this approximation is, is, is valid is because uh, the back reaction of, the, of this quantum field on the classical metric is suppressed by a factor of this form, where mp is the Planck mass and m is the mass of the black hole. So uh, the back reaction of the quantum field on the classical metric uh, is suppressed by this factor. If you plug in the numbers for an astrophysical sized black hole, this is incredibly small, of the order of 10 to the minus 40 or so. So uh, all gravitational interactions between these quantum particles are suppressed, and in particular, we can uh, keep the metric classical and fixed, and then quantize the, field, the fields on top of that metric. So we will want to consider, for simplicity, a massless Klein-Gordon field. And uh, we write down the equation for this field, and we try to quantize it using this metric as the background. Now, let me remind you that uh, if you look at this metric, uh, if you are outside the star, the metric is uh, Schwarzschild. Uh, in the interior of the star, the metric is different. So we have to take it into account when we try to solve this equation. Now, if you want to quantize a field, uh, this is a free field, so a, a, an easy way to quantize it is to expand it to a set of modes. And um, one choice is to select the modes which represent particles uh, coming in from, uh, minus, uh, from the infinite past. So this is a, this is a massless field, so it, it describes massless particles which are coming from minus null infinity, from past null infinity. And uh, you can take the field and expand it into uh, a set of, uh, of modes where you have some wave functions and uh, operators which play the role of creation and inhalation operators. And these operators represent particles coming in from, from the past. So these operators uh, obey the usual algebra that uh, they're labeled by frequency and angular momentum, and they obey the usual oscillator algebra. So in this way, you can build up a Fox space of particles representing uh, excitations coming in from the past. Yeah. When you say yes. Exactly plane waves it's convenient to work in a base of plane waves. You don't have to do that, but it's, it's yes. You, you, you can work with plane waves, or we can try to build up wave packets out of these plane waves. Now, this expansion is relevant for this uh, cosy slice that I have drawn in blue on this diagram. So this blue line represents a cosy slice, and you can expand the field in modes which are defined on this slice. However, we can imagine taking this slice and continuously deforming it towards the future uh, up to the point where it becomes this purple line, part of which is along the horizon, and the other part is on future null infinity. This is another cosy slice. So uh, in, when we do quantum field theory in curved space-time, there is not a unique way to expand the field in modes, as you know. There are more than one ways. And in particular, we can consider an expansion of the same quantum field uh, in modes which are relevant for this cosy slice. When we do that, uh, we get an expansion which looks slightly different. So now we have two different sets of, uh, of, of, of modes, the modes uh, G and H. Uh, which uh, this, this, this modes G, which multiply the creation and inhalation operators B, represent particles uh, going out in future null infinity, while this, uh, uh, these modes represent particles falling into the horizon. So we have two different sets of modes which describe particles falling into the black hole or flying out to infinity. And correspondingly, we have a creation and inhalation operators B and C. These arrows just represent particles going through this uh, horizon or through this, uh, or through, uh, you know, future null infinity. So 
So we have, we have um, the quantum field phi, and we have expanded it into different bases. But of course, uh, there should be a relationship between them, because after all, it's, it's one quantum field. So uh, in principle, we should be able to uh, rewrite, uh, to find the chains of bases between the modes uh, F and the modes G and H. So I remind you, these are solutions of the wave equation on this background, and this is a complete base of solutions. These two guys together is another complete basis. So in principle, you should be able to transform from one to the other. And if you find the transformation between the wave functions, F, G, and H, you can also find the transformation of the uh, operators A, B, and C. Yes, uh, so B and B dagger obey a similar, similar algebra. So it's similar to this one. C and C dagger the same, and B and C commute. Because by definition, we have taken the, the modes B to have support on future null infinity, and the Cs to have support on the horizon. So B and C, Bs and Cs commute. So we want to find the, the transformation between these uh, two uh, bases of solutions, and um, this will allow us to also to express the operators B, C in terms of A, A, and A dagger. Now, uh, as we said before, the, uh, the modes in the, uh, in, past, in the past null infinity form a complete basis. So in particular, if you take this operator B in the far future, it should be possible to express it as a linear combination of the A's and A daggers. Now, uh, here we have some coefficients multiplying the modes. These indices i and j, you can think of them as denoting the frequencies omega L m, or perhaps you can you want to form wave packets which are labeled by some quantum number uh, i and j. So in general, what this equation is telling you is that these uh, modes b in the far future will be linear combinations of a's. And what is perhaps a little bit surprising is that not only a's, but also a daggers. So as a matter of principle, we will want to write down the most general transformation between these modes and these modes, which will mix positive and negative frequencies. So in general, we will have a transformation of this form. And what uh, Hawking uh, found was that uh, in this particular geometry, it turns out that both of these coefficients are non-zero, which in particular means that what uh, is an annihilation operator for a mode in the far future is a linear combination of creation and annihilation operators of modes in the far past. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yes. Okay, but A and B don't commute. No. Okay, but what? Well, the, these are. Surfaces, no? no, I mean, no, no. This, this surface, these surfaces are in the future of this one. Ah, okay. Right? Ah, but cool. this one and that one are, are sort of space like separated. Ah, okay. Yeah. Okay. So, what Hawking did is that he actually calculated or he found a way of estimating these coefficients. And he found that both of them are non-zero. The important thing for us is that beta is non-zero, which means that if you define the vacuum of the quantum field as the state which has no particles in the far past, this is how we define the vacuum at early times. And if you try to calculate now uh, the expectation value of the number operator for particles in the far future, so B dagger B, if you use this equation and the fact that beta is not zero, you find that you get something which is non-zero. So you get particles in the far future. So this is the, uh, the, the idea of the calculation. And if you, if you really want to do it uh, ex like uh, in detail, uh, what you need to do in principle is take the wave equation of this classical geometry find the solution of the wave equation and relate the solutions at late times to solutions at early times. Right? Yes. I'm sorry, I can't hear you very well. Um, well, the, 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 this, the, these solutions, the, solution, the modes F, uh, are defined to have a, a simple form at uh, minus uh, infinity, right? At minus null infinity. While uh, these are defined, G and A are defined in future null infinity and on the horizon. So it is one geometry, which is however time dependent, right? It's a collapsing black hole. So it's a time dependent geometry. So the expansion at early times may be different from the expansion at late times.
uh, you do not put any boundary condition on the horizon uh, in this calculation, right? Well, th this small CNC dagger go through the horizon, so you do not constrain them, right? You do not impose any condition on these guys. For example, if you start with a wave packet in the far past, you can evolve it forward using the Klein-Gordon equation, and the result of this calculation will tell you which part of the wave falls into the horizon and which part flies out to infinity. You, you don't want to impose anything by hand. Yes? Yes. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, good. Uh, so the last question was, uh, do we impose any boundary conditions on the horizon? Like, do we impose the condition that, uh, I don't know what you had in mind, but I do not impose any boundary conditions on the horizon in this calculation. Yes? I'm sorry, I have a call that I cannot hear very well. Could you, could you, could you speak a bit louder? Yeah, yeah, okay, so, in the, so the question was, um, uh, part of the space-time differs from the Schwarzschild geometry. The interior of the star is not Schwarzschild, right? The metric inside the star is not the Schwarzschild metric. So when you try to solve this, equa this wave equation, if you want to do it properly, you have to take that into account. But uh, as we will see in a little bit, uh, that does not have an effect, an important effect, for the behavior of these coefficients, uh, which are relevant, for the late time radiation, so the radiation at late times, after the black hole settles down. So the reason will probably become clear in the next slide. Yes. Well, um, that's not very important because uh, what I want to, uh, to, to that, so the question was with, with how exactly do I define this, uh, this, how do I select this basis of functions? Uh, the answer to this question is that it doesn't really matter because for this calculation, all I need to know is the relationship between B and A. I, I don't want to make any statement right now about the, the state of the quantum field uh, on the horizon. I just want to find the relationship between B and A. So for that calculation, uh, the choice of uh, this base, the, the details of this basis are, is not important. Okay, so this, uh, so this is the idea, and uh, in principle we have to solve this complicated wave equation problem, but uh, that's really difficult. So I want to um, now give you some uh, intuitive understanding of how uh, Hawking was able to estimate the result without solving the wave equation. And um, let me... Um, uh, let, 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 me, um, well, let, let me introduce this uh, coordinate, our star, which is called the tortoise coordinate. Uh, this is a coordinate which allows us to write the source symmetric in this form. So we introduce a new radial coordinate, R star, in such a way that uh, the coefficients in front of the t squared and the new coordinate, the R star squared, are the same. Uh, because in this new coordinate system, we can immediately write down the equation obeyed by, null by radial null geodesics. So, um, so in this coordinate system, in falling light rays, uh, obey uh, t, um, plus R star is constant, an outgoing light rays T minus R star constant. And uh, by looking at this equation, this, this form of the metric, and comparing it to the uh, Schwarzschild solution that we started with, you can actually calculate what is R star in terms of R, and you find that um, uh, R star is equal to uh, R plus um, 2GM log uh, R minus 2GM over 2GM. So this new coordinate, R star, uh, if you go very far from the black hole, uh, this is the dominant term. The logarithm is also important. 
So very far away from the black hole, R star is more or less the same thing as R. But when you go near the horizon, uh, you notice that uh, this logarithm blows up, it goes to minus infinity. So near the horizon, R star goes to minus infinity. Okay, so uh, we introduce this coordinate and then uh, because of this property that in falling light rays obey a very simple equation, we introduce uh, light concoordinates, uh, U and V. So uh, this is V and this is U. So uh, light rays which uh, come from uh, past null infinity can be labeled by the parameter V and light rays in the far future can be labeled by the parameter U. Now, as you can see from this diagram, there is a very special light ray in the far uh, past, which is at a particular value of V called V naught, which has the property that uh, as it goes in and, gets and when it gets reflected at R equals zero, it actually becomes a horizon. So this is a very special light ray. Now, any light ray which uh, has a smaller value of V, so any light ray that was emitted earlier than V naught, is going to reach R equals zero before the horizon is formed, and it's going to fly out to infinity. While any light ray which, is, uh, which comes in with a value of V larger than V naught is going to uh, reach R equals zero after the horizon has formed and will fall into the singularity, right? So, uh, in this way, we can see that uh, these particles that we get out of, uh, uh, as Hawking radiation at very late times, if we're sitting there, are these particles which came from this special point V0, very near this point. In particular, remember that two slides ago, I told you that this, the distances in this Penrose diagram are uh, somewhat misleading. So uh, this corner here represents an infinite region of flat space, even though it's mapped into this finite region. And what we see from this diagram is that all of the light rays which will ever get out of the black hole, even at very, very late times, they all uh, emerge from this very small region near V equals to V naught. So in that sense, uh, this very small region uh, in uh, the parameter V is magnified by an enormous factor by the black hole and is mapped into this infinite region in the U parameter. So this, the black hole acts as a microscope which magnifies uh, the structure of uh, the moles in the UV and uh, maps them into moles of, 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 of long wavelength in the far future. Now, the reason that this happens uh, can be understood by uh, the fact that there's a, a very large gravitational redshift for these light rays which travel very close to the horizon. So the idea is the following. Uh, let's imagine for a moment that instead of a, black, of a black hole, we had a static star. So there was no time dependence, just a star. When a light ray uh, fall, comes from infinity and falls towards the star, it gets blue shifted because the, the star is, is pulling the, the, the light ray, so it goes down the gravitational potential and it gets blue shifted. The, it reaches R equals zero, it gets reflected, and as it goes out, it gets red shifted. Now, if the star is static and time independent, these two effects are uh, symmetric, equivalent. So there is no net blue shift or red shift as the light ray goes through the star. But here we have a time dependent geometry, which means that uh, in the beginning, the, these light rays uh, approach the star and they get accelerated, they, they get blue shifted. But <clears throat> when they try to get out, the star has collapsed a little bit. So the gravitational field is stronger now and these light rays try to escape, but the redshift is more important than the blue shift that they underwent. So there's a net redshift for the light rays that go through this collapsing geometry. So if you start with a, with a light ray of some particular frequency, uh, what you will get out is a light ray with, with a lower frequency. And in fact, you can think of this special uh, light ray V0 as a light ray which suffers an infinite amount of redshift and that thus is unable to get out to infinity. So these light rays which are very close to uh, V0 uh, have the property that uh, they undergo a very significant redshift, which means that if you want to uh, study uh, modes with a frequency omega in the far future, uh, and you, if you trace these modes back to where they came from, you will find that they came from modes which had much higher frequency. 
So we start with MOS with very high frequency. They propagate to the star, they get redshifted, and they emerge on the other side as MOS of low frequency. These are the Hawking particles. The Hawking particles have relatively low frequencies, but if you trace them back to see where they came from, they came from MOS of the quantum field, which had extremely high energy. Now, this is very useful for us because um, if you have uh, the MOS of a quantum field, uh, of very high frequency, it means that they have very short wavelengths. And then you want to study the propagations of modes with short wavelengths on a time-dependent geometry. But as you can imagine, if the wavelength of the particles is very small, we can use an approximation to uh, study the propagation of those waves, which is called the geometric optics approximation. So that, that is what we do with light, right? If you want to study the propagation of light in a, in a, in a, in a geometry whose uh, typical size is much larger than the wavelength, you can think of uh, electromagnetic waves as light rays, and they just move on null geodesics, and then you can calculate how they propagate without having to solve the wave equation, which is much harder. So because these modes start off as modes of very, very high frequency, we can use the geometric optics approximation to study how they propagate to the star. And then what, the only thing we need to know is the relationship of the, 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 the equation for null geodesics following these trajectories, which you can determine very easily. And the important thing is that you get a relationship of this form. You get that uh, at late times, uh, the, there is a, uh, you can calculate the parameter u of a geodesic uh, in terms of the parameter v uh, where for the geodesic when it started at early times. And you find that it's given by this equation, just by solving the, the, the geodesic equation in this diagram. And the important thing is that we get this logarithm, uh, which uh, blows up as v goes to v naught. So this equation makes sense only for the light rays, which, are, uh, which have v less than v naught, because these are the light rays that are able to escape to infinity. These light rays will fall into the singularity. So you get this uh, geodesic uh, equation, and uh, this allows you to uh, estimate uh, these coefficients alpha and beta without having to solve the wave equation. Yeah. Well, I, the equation was, uh, OK, in the beginning, the wavelength is very, very short, so we can use the geometric optics approximation. Uh, but as I explained, this, these waves undergo gravitational redshift, so the wavelength increases. And then the, there will be a point where you can no longer apply the geometric op optics approximation. And the question was, how do we deal with that uh, issue? Uh, the point is that we can, we, it is necessary for us to apply the geometric optics approximation up to the point where this uh, light ray is out of this collapsing star. Because the geometry on this part of the space time is just Schwarzschild, static, and it's relatively simple. So uh, we just want to make sure that the geometric optics approximation is reliable uh, up to the point where this particle can, can escape from the star. And this is true for uh, uh, if you want to study particles at late times. Yeah, this equation is true only for very late, late uh, for, for very large u, or for Vvec. No, in, in this limit does not depend on the details. Okay. Sorry. It doesn't. It doesn't. It doesn't play an important role for uh, estimating these coefficients. So the only thing we want to do out of this calculation is to estimate the coefficients uh, alpha and beta, which I remind you were the Bogolyubov coefficients relating the, the modes at late times to the modes at early times. OK, so uh, we can then use the geometric optics approximation to calculate these coefficients. And um, this is what Hawking did. And uh, as we will discuss later, this uh, predicts thermal radiation coming out of the black hole. Now, um, I want to also uh, give you another uh, intuitive uh, picture of, the, of how uh, this computation works. Uh, here I have uh, sort of plotted a cartoon of a, of a, of a small wave uh, at uh, m uh, uh, past null infinity. And we think of this wave as propagating inwards. And then we notice that uh, when it gets reflected, it sort of splits in two parts, the part that uh, makes it out to infinity and the part that falls into the horizon, into the, into the singularity. 
Now, this uh, picture highlights the idea of uh, pair production. So it highlights the idea that Hawking radiation can be thought of as pair production. And uh, an important aspect of this calculation that will be important later is that uh, because you start with this wave, uh, these points are close together. And uh, if you look at these two excitations, they turn out to be in an entangled state. So these two part if you think of them as two separate particles, that are in a highly entangled state. That's what follows in the calculation of Hawking. And the intuition is the one I have shown on this diagram. So these purple and blue uh, uh, waves are, uh, if you think of them as quantum mechanical particles, they're entangled. And one of them falls into the singularity, and the other one flies out to infinity. Now, as this, guy, this blue guy travels away from uh, the black hole, the entanglement with the black hole remains. It, does, it cannot disappear. So in this way, you get particles at, at infinity which seem to be entangled with a black hole which is sitting uh, there. Um, so this uh, entanglement will play a very important role in uh, formulating the paradox uh, in the next uh, slides. So please try to remember uh, this point. Uh, also, I, I, I will mention, uh, I, I will make it more precise later, but I will mention at this point that uh, if you look at an infalling observer going through the, this, uh, these particles, the infalling observer, observer does not detect these particles as on-shell propagating particles. So the, the infalling observer thinks that the quantum field is in the ground state locally. And for that to happen, for that to be possible that uh, the infalling observer does not detect any particles, it is very important that these two particles are highly entangled. We will uh, illustrate this in more detail uh, in Minkowski space uh, later. Uh, but uh, yeah, I just want to mention it now. Okay, so uh, what Hawking found uh, after doing this calculation is that um, this, this coefficient beta is non-zero, and then this allows one to calculate the expectation value of the number operator of modes in the far future. And what you find is a thermal uh, distribution, so this, this is a thermal radiation, uh, multiplied by a coefficient which uh, slightly modifies the spectrum from being thermal. These are called the gray body factors. And these coefficients are basically the probability for um, a particle to uh, get absorbed by the black hole. So it depends on the frequency and the angular momentum of the mode. Um, this will not have any important uh, significance for what, what I'm going to say. So from now on, we will ignore this factor and we'll just assume that the spectrum of Hawking radiation is thermal. The temperature beta, the inverse temperature beta, is related to the mass of the black hole by this equation. And um, uh, I want to emphasize that when we say that the, the spectrum is, is thermal, uh, we mean that the expectation value of the number operator is, is this one, but also the higher moments. So, uh, for example, uh, B dagger B uh, is uh, thermal. And also, if you start calculating the higher moments, for example, the expectation value of uh, B dagger B to the power K, uh, if you calculate this object, it's precisely the same thing as what you would have calculated uh, by considering a harmonic oscillator uh, of frequency omega and a temperature beta. So this is going to be trace of e to the minus uh, beta omega b dagger b uh, times b dagger b to the power k divided by z. So what this means is that we do not get a, a, a definite number of particles at any given uh, mode, but we get a thermal distribution precisely the same as what the one you would have if you take a harmonic oscillator and you place it at temperature beta. So this is true for every single mode. And uh, moreover, uh, what, we find, what you find in the calculation of Hawking is that higher point functions between these modes B are uh, actually uh, factorized the product of two point functions. So there are no genuine higher point functions in the calculation. No, there are no connected higher point functions. The connected high, higher point function are zero. So this means that uh, the radiation that we get in the calculation of Hawking is uh, thermal. So the particles seem to be, th the modes seem to be thermally populated. And what is very important, they seem to be uncorrelated. There are no correlations between the outgoing particles. This follows from the fact that these higher point functions factorize. Yes. Yes, uh, of course, this, uh, the question was, is this, uh, uh, does this follow from the fact that phi did not interact with itself? That was the question. Yes, if the field phi is interacting, then you will get some, uh, some correlations. 
or if you take into account uh, the back reaction of the field of the metric, I, I told you before that we ignore that effect because uh, of this uh, condition. But uh, so if there are self-interactions between the field phi, or if you take into account the interactions with the gravitational field, this will introduce some correlations. But uh, for reasons I will explain later, uh, it is believed that these correlations that we introduce in that way are not sufficient in order to solve the paradox that I'm going to talk about. Yeah. Uh, well, uh, you can compute it, but uh, it, for, for, this, for, this, uh, like for the statement we want to make now, it doesn't have any significance. We just want to know what happens at the future null infinity now. Okay, so uh, then Hawking predicts that the Hawking particles are in a thermal state. Uh, more precisely, it means that if you calculate the density matrix of the Hawking radiation, it is thermal, and, uh, it, which means in particular it's diagonal in uh, the occupation basis uh, of the modes uh, in, uh, at future null infinity. Now, uh, if, we get, if we now uh, take this uh, result uh, that the black hole emits thermal radiation, it means that it, it will lose energy it, and um, uh, it will, uh, uh, its mass will decrease as a function of time. So you can try to estimate the, uh, the rate at which the black hole loses energy and uh, you find that, um, uh, you, that uh, the time derivative of the mass of the black hole is given by this uh, by this formula. Now, to, to get this result, uh, if you want to do it properly, you need to uh, consider the details of this calculation, including this gray body factor, and integrate over all modes to calculate the power generated by the black hole. But it turns out that you get a correct uh, order of magnitude estimate by thinking of the horizon as a black body uh, at temperature T. So then, uh, the Stefan Boltzmann law says that uh, the power radiated by this uh, black body, so d by dt, is going to be given by the area of this surface times uh, some constant, which sigma, which will depend on the number of fields that you have in your theory, and so on and so forth, times t to the fourth. And if you replace uh, the area uh, by, uh, so this proportional to g squared m squared, the area is proportional to g squared m squared, and the temperature is one over gm, so we get one over g to the fourth, m to the fourth, uh, which gives us a scaling that we have uh, on the slide. So, the black hole um, radiates as black body at temperature one over uh, eight pi gm, and uh, it loses mass according to this formula, which you can integrate, and you can estimate the evaporation time, uh, and you find that it scales with the third power of the mass. And as you probably know, uh, if you uh, plug in some numbers for, let's say, a solar-sized black hole, this time scale turns out to be uh, you know, incredibly large, like uh, 10 to the 60 years or something like that, which means that the evaporation of a large black hole is an extremely slow process. In particular, this time scale is much, 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 much longer than the typical time scale, which, is, uh, which plays a role in the calculation of Hawking. And because of this hierarchy of scales between the evaporation time and uh, the time scale relevant for calculating uh, the Hawking effect, uh, it is a good approximation to treat the black hole as quasi-static and do the Hawking calculation for any given mass and uh, without worrying about the fact that the geometry uh, will change as a function of time. I mean, the previous calculation that I highlighted was done in a geometry where there's no evaporation, but now if we take into account the back reaction of the evaporation of the geometry, uh, the black hole will eventually evaporate. So this is the new Penrose diagram where uh, the black hole uh, evaporates and we're left with the Hawking radiation flying, flying out uh, uh, to infinity. Now, in this new Penrose diagram, uh, uh, we notice that at some point the black hole uh, disappears. Now, this little corner uh, is not, uh, we cannot study it reliably because the black hole has very small mass and uh, the curvature be at the horizon becomes very large. So we don't really know what happens there, but this will not have any important implication for what I'm going to talk about. Okay, so now uh, we, uh, we are ready to, to formulate the paradox, at least in the most basic version. Uh, it's the following. Uh, we found that Hawking predicts that uh, the, the black hole emits thermal radiation, and that is inconsistent with unitarity in quantum mechanics because uh, well, according to Hawking, a pure state evolves into a mixed state, rho thermal, while in quantum mechanics, a pure state will always remain a pure state because it evolves unitarily with Hamiltonian. 
So uh, under a unitary evolution, you can never have a, a, a pure state evolving into, into a mixed state. So this is a, this is a, this is a paradox, it's a conflict between the calculation of Hawking and uh, what we expect uh, in a unitary quantum mechanics. Another way of uh, saying that is that according to the calculation of Hawking, um, the, the radiation that you get at, in the far future only depends on the mass of the black hole. So uh, obviously you can form a black hole of given mass in many different ways. And according to the calculation of Hawking, you always get the same final state, which seems that it, 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 there is some loss of reversibility in physics. Uh, or said differently, there is some information loss. By looking at the final radiation, you cannot uh, uh, reconstruct what was the star that formed the black hole. Yeah. That are what? Entering? Yeah. Yes. Well, the question was, there are also some particles which are falling into the black hole. Let's say these guys. So the question was, since we have these particles, is it correct to think of the outgoing photons as a closed system? That was the question, right? Well, you're right. If the black hole did not evaporate, your objection would be perfectly fine. And there will be no paradox, because it would not have been a closed system. There will be some, something inside the black hole, something outside. Maybe the information is stored inside the black hole. So th that wouldn't be a paradox. The problem is that if we take the back reaction of this into account of this radiation, the black hole evaporates and it completely disappears at some point. So if you look at the updated Penrose diagram where we take evaporation into account, we note that at very late times, let's say if you, if you draw this slice, there is no black hole anymore, right? You just have flat space, empty flat space, and Hawking radiation fly, flying out you know, towards future null infinity. So there's no black hole. So these modes that you were talking about have disappeared. So we cannot use them to uh, say that the information is stored there. That, that's precisely the problem, the paradox. So, uh, right, so we have this, this, this paradox. And now uh, you could ask a, a question here is, could this calculation that Hawking did uh, is reliable uh, only uh, to the extent that, uh, as I already mentioned, uh, M Planck over M is much smaller than one. But as the black hole evaporates, it, will, it gets smaller, and there will be a point where the size of the black hole will be Planckian. And at that point, the calculation of Hawking is no longer reliable. So you could say, could it be that during the final stages of the evaporation where the black hole is almost Planckian size, could it be that the radiation is dramatically modified at that point and all the information comes out you know, at once during the, the end point of the evaporation? Now, I will try to argue that that is not possible, that's not consistent. And to do that, let me uh, introduce one, one, one more idea, which is the, the following. We consider the Hawking particles as they come out of the black hole, and uh, we take, the, let's say, the first n Hawking particles, and we calculate the reduced density matrix, rho n, of those particles, and the von Neumann entropy of that matrix, of that density matrix. Now, I already explained in the previous slide that uh, the black, the, the, these Hawking particles turn out to be thermal and uncorrelated. So this means that uh, if you look at only one Hawking particle, it will have some entanglement entropy, uh, S1, uh, which is minus trace uh, rho one. The reduced density matrix of one Hawking particle, which is thermal, uh, log rho one. So this quantity is non-zero. Now, if we take two Hawking particles, the reduced density matrix of two Hawking particles is going to be the product of uh, rho one times rho one. Why? Because we argued that these particles are uncorrelated. According to the calculation of Hawking, every Hawking particle is independent uh, of the previous Hawking particles. So if you take two of those, the density matrix will be the product. So if you calculate the entanglement entropy of this direct product, tensor product, you find that uh, the entanglement entropy is actually two times the entanglement entropy of one particle. And if you do it, uh, you know, n times, if you consider n Hawking particles, you find that the density matrix is uh, rho one to the power n, 
So the entanglement entropy of uh, n Hawking particles in, is n times the entanglement entropy of one. In other words, according to the calculation of Hawking, the entanglement entropy of the Hawking radiation keeps increasing linearly with the number of particles. Now, uh, in the beginning, that's fine. It's like having a, a, you know, a heat bath or, or some, if you burn a piece of paper or some other object at finite temperature and you look at radiation coming from it, then uh, the photons are almost independent in the beginning and indeed the, the entropy of those, of those particles keeps increasing. But, uh, uh, so this is, there's no problem at the beginning of this process, but it, we can ask what happens at very late times. And at very late times, if we want the theory to be unitary, it must be that after the black hole has completely evaporated, uh, the entanglement entropy of the radiation has to go to zero. Why? Well, if the uh, process is unitary, and if you start with a pure state, then the Hawking radiation after the evaporation of the black hole has to be in a pure state, and a pure state has zero entanglement entropy. So if we, want to, if we believe that the process is unitary, this curve that Hawking calculated has to be corrected into a curve which dives down and reaches zero when the black hole completely evaporates. So the question I was addressing before is, could it be that this curve, the entanglement entropy of the Hawking radiation as a function of the number of particles, uh, increases linearly, and then at some point, very near the end point, where the calculation of Hawking is no longer reli reliable, it uh, goes down to zero uh, during the, the last burst of radiation coming from the black hole. So this would be the scenario where the black hole emits all of the information during the last stages where the calculation of Hawking is no longer reliable. Now, I want to explain that this is not consistent. So, are there any questions about uh, the, the question I'm trying to address? Say again? So as the uh, black hole evaporates and becomes smaller, then the curvature near the horizon becomes very large, right? Exactly. So, exactly. so then uh, can we say that when a particle crosses the horizon, it will be like before that the, there's like little change or something? Means there's what? Means, uh, so earlier we, we could assume that as the particle uh, crosses the horizon, there's not much change because the curvature because, is... Yeah, yeah. So, near, so near the end point of the evaporation, we cannot assume anything because the curvature is very high. Yeah. Uh, it, it, the curvature could be of the order of the Planck scale, so we, we can no longer like, control the geometry. And in particular, we cannot trust the Hawking calculation anymore, right? That's precisely the point. So the Hawking calculation would tell you that this curve will just continue to increase, right? Now, one way of resol resolving the paradox would be to postulate that uh, this last part of the calculation is unreliable because the black hole is tiny, and the calculation has to be replaced by some other calculation of quantum gravity, which will allow all the information to get out at once, like in a very short amount of time. But this is a bit problematic for the following reason. Uh, this entanglement entropy, if you think about the physical meaning of this entanglement entropy of the Hawking radiation, it's, it is the following. We have uh, the black hole, and then we have the radiation very far away. And there is some, uh, this guy, this radiation has no zero entropy because it is entangled with a black hole, right? Now, uh, we believe that black holes are quantum mechanical systems which have a Hilbert space with finite dimensionality. And we believe that the size of that Hilbert space is determined by the area of the horizon. So in the beginning, the black hole is very big the Hilbert space of the black hole is very large, so there is no problem. Everything is fine. It can be entangled with Hawking radiation. But as the black hole evaporates, uh, the size of the, of, this, uh, uh, of the Hilbert space of the black hole decreases because the area decreases. So if I plot on the same diagram the, 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 the logarithm of the dimensionality of the, of the Hilbert space of the black hole, we start at a very large value where this is A over 4G, and as the black hole evaporates, the size of the Hilbert space of the black hole decreases. Now, there will be a point where it will cross the other line, beyond which it means that the size of the Hilbert space of the black hole is smaller than the entanglement entropy that you need in order to purify the Hawking radiation by the early black hole. Now, I remind you that uh, if you, the, the entanglement entropy of a, of, a, of a system is bounded from above by the logarithm of the dimensionality of that system. 
So when the black hole becomes smaller than what this curve predicts, then it, doesn't, it, no, it no longer makes sense to, uh, to expect that the Hawking radiation is entangled with a black hole because the, the, entanglement that, the amount of entanglement that you need is actually larger than the size of the Hilbert space of a black hole. So this means that this scenario where the entanglement entropy keeps increasing and only goes down to zero near the end of the black hole is inconsistent way before the time where the black hole has Planckian size. You run into a contradiction way earlier where you can estimate the size of a black hole at that point and it turns out to be macroscopic. So th it's not consistent to assume that uh, the radiation is uh, pure thermal uh, all the way to the last stage of the evaporation where it suddenly becomes unitary and all the information comes out in a very short amount of time. That does, doesn't make sense. It is not consistent with the, um, with a, well, with a, the idea that a, a black hole of size A has a Hilbert space uh, which is determined by this uh, area. Okay. Yes. Good. So the question is what about corrections? And let me continue because I'm going to talk about corrections now. So uh, now, okay, we have formulated this paradox and uh, what are the possibilities? Uh, for resolving it. Uh, well, th th there are two possibilities that have been discussed in the literature. One is that uh, information is fundamentally lost. That was the original proposal of Hawking. Uh, but uh, for reasons that I will explain a little bit, uh, we no longer believe that this is the right answer. Uh, another possibility is that of remnants, uh, which is the idea that uh, uh, the black hole, um, uh, the, the evaporation stops at some point, let's say near, near that uh, point where the size of the black hole is Planckian, and uh, you're left behind with an object, which is called a remnant, which is a stable object, uh, which has very small mass, so it has the, like Planck mass, and it has uh, a very large Hilbert space, so the Hilbert space must be large enough to be able to accommodate all this entanglement with Hawking radiation, and uh, that would be a possibility, but uh, it leads to other problems, and uh, as I will explain, it is also ruled out by ADCFT. So both of these two possibilities uh, 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 we're not going to discuss them a lot. In my opinion, the strongest argument against these possibilities is that in the ADCFT correspondence, uh, we do not have information loss because the boundary theory is manifestly unitary, and we don't have remnants because uh, in some situations we can actually calculate the spectrum of the CFT and we can see that there are no particles with these peculiar properties. So we will consider the third uh, possibility that somehow uh, the information of the, of the black hole is encoded in a small corrections to the calculation of Hawking. Now, uh, if you think about it intuitively, it's the most natural explanation because this is what happens, for example, if you burn a piece of paper. If you burn a piece of paper, you get radiation which seems to be thermal. Uh, so you would, well, but we don't worry about information loss. Why, why is that? The answer is that we don't worry about information loss when we burn a piece of paper because the photons uh, appear to be thermal, but in reality, uh, they're not exactly thermal. There are small correlations between those photons, and those correlations are, are sufficient in order to encode the information of the, of the piece of paper. So the question is, could something similar uh, be happening in the case of the, of the Hawking calculation? Could small corrections to the calculation of Hawking resolve the paradox? Now, before I go on, let me make two clarifications. Uh, the first is that uh, in what I'm going to say, uh, we are not going to be able to actually calculate these corrections. So uh, what we will be able to, uh, be, th this would be a very difficult problem which would be equivalent to being able to calculate the exact S matrix in quantum gravity. If you really want to be able to calculate the exact quantum state of the, of the particles in the future null infinity, that would be as hard as being able to calculate a scattering experiment including all full quantum gravity effects. So that's clearly out of reach today. So instead, what we are trying to do when we try to resolve this paradox is we, we try to estimate how big those corrections have to be, what's the minimal size of those corrections, and then we want to see whether those corrections are expected based on general arguments and whether they are consistent with effective field theory. So we want to uh, estimate the size of these corrections and then based on the result of that we will get, we will decide whether this is a reasonable uh, size, it's whether we expect corrections of that type, and whether they, these corrections are consistent with effective field theory. Yeah. Let's see. 
So are you assuming that there are a large, there's a large number of Hawking quanta so that the overall uh, uh, entanglement entropy, uh, the contribution to the entanglement, entanglement entropy uh, by these correlations, small correlations, the overall contribution is such that it cancels the Precisely. thermal computation. So I, 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 want, I, I mean, of course we have a lot of Hawking particles, right? I mean, just to uh, remind everyone, if a black hole evaporates, you can estimate the number of particles that you get, and the number of particles is of the order of the, of the entropy of the black hole. So it's a huge number of particles, and as you say, uh, these small corrections, there, there are many possible pairs you can write down, and you can introduce small corrections to, all of the, to the correlations between all of these pairs, or you can take also groups of these particles and introduce correlations among them. So because of the size of this Hilbert space, this is a very large Hilbert space, it is possible to introduce small corrections which will turn a mixed state into a pure state. That will be the point. So, uh, yes, I am running out of time, right? Uh, do I have five minutes or? Uh, uh, okay, just five minutes. Uh, okay. So, uh, okay. So I, I actually, okay, I will try to close now. And uh, this afternoon, I will try to explain the, the, the following uh, results in more detail. So uh, the claim I want to, to present this afternoon is that uh, the unitarity can be restored in the Hawking calculation just by introducing exponentially small corrections in the entropy, so e to the minus s, to simple observables in, in effect field theory. So what this means is that uh, we will see that uh, you can think of the Hawking calculation as being a, a reliable computation up to exponentially small corrections, provided that you focus your attention on what we call simple observables in effect field theory. So I will make it a little bit more precise uh, this afternoon what we mean by that. Um, uh, but roughly speaking, uh, simple observables are uh, low point functions of, of, uh, of the quantum field or the background of a black hole while uh, a correlation function with S black hole insertions would be classified as a complicated observable. So the statement would be that the Hawking calculation is reliable for the computation of low point functions up to exponentially small deviations, but it may be completely unreliable for the computation of high point functions uh, of uh, local operators uh, when a black hole evaporates. Uh, so, uh, and I will try to argue that this claims relies on a very basic property uh, of quantum statistical mechanics, which uh, is uh, the property that uh, if you have a, a large system, a large quantum system with many degrees of freedom, uh, most pure states look exactly the same, or almost exactly the same, as mixed states. So this statement I just made, I will quantify it, I will make it precise uh, this afternoon, and I will explain what it implies about the, uh, the information paradox. Thank you. Oh.